Picture yourself next to tram tracks. In the distance, a trolley is racing uncontrollably towards five workers who cannot hear it. Even if they see it, they won't have time to escape. You see a lever by the tracks. Pulling it would send the trolley onto another track, away from the five workers. But there is another worker on this other track, unaware like the others. Would you pull the lever, causing one death, but saving five? This scenario is at the heart of the well-known trolley problem, a thought experiment first introduced by philosopher Philippa Foote in 1967 and later revised by Judith Thompson in 1985. The trolley problem encourages us to ponder the results of our actions and question if the rightness of an action is based only on its outcome. Now think about a different version of this problem. You're on a bridge above the tram tracks. Down below, a runaway trolley is speeding towards five workers who don't know it's coming. This time, there is no lever to change its course. But there is a large man next to you. It seems likely that, if he were on the tracks, he could stop the trolley. Would you push him onto the tracks, trading his life to save the five workers? The end result here is the same as in the lever scenario. One life lost, five saved. Yet it's curious to note that, while many people might pull a lever to divert danger, far fewer feel comfortable with the idea of pushing someone to prevent the same danger. The trolley problem underscores the conflict between two schools of moral thought, utilitarianism and deontological ethics. Utilitarianism, famously espoused by philosophers like John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, posits that the right action is the one that maximizes overall happiness or utility. From a utilitarian perspective, pulling the lever is the morally correct choice, as it results in fewer lives lost and greater overall utility. On the other hand, deontological ethics, a theory associated with Immanuel Kant, argues that morality is rooted in duty and rules, and the consequences of actions are not the sole factor in determining their morality. Kant's famous maxim, act only according to that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law, suggests that the morality of an action is determined by whether its principle can be universally applied. In the context of the trolley problem, a deontologist might argue that pulling the lever constitutes a deliberate action to harm an individual, which cannot be morally justified, even if it results in fewer deaths. The problem becomes even more complex when variations are introduced. For instance, what if the one person on the alternate track is a renowned scientist whose research could save thousands of lives? Could this change the moral calculus? These variations demonstrate that moral decision-making is not always black and white. They highlight the difficulty of creating a universal ethical rule that can be applied to every situation. One significant aspect of the trolley problem is its exploration of the difference between doing harm and allowing harm. When we choose to pull the lever, we actively participate in the outcome. This active participation is often seen as morally different from passively allowing the trolley to continue on its path, resulting in the death of five. This distinction echoes a fundamental question in moral philosophy. Is there a moral difference between doing harm and merely allowing harm to happen? In 2001, Joshua Green and his team pioneered a significant study on people's reactions to trolley problems using functional MRI. They found that personal dilemmas like pushing someone off a bridge activated emotional brain regions, while impersonal ones like flipping a switch to divert a trolley involved more reasoning areas. In 2017, Michael Stevens' group conducted the first realistic trolley problem experiment. Participants thinking they were in a train switching station watched uh, what they believed were live feeds of a train heading towards workers. Most chose not to divert the train. Surveys on the trolley problem show us about 90% of people would sacrifice one person to save five. This, however, changes when the lone individual is a loved one. The trolley problem can be applied in various disciplines. Consider the application of the trolley problem in law. A judge may face a trolley-like decision when sentencing an individual whose crime was committed under unsure circumstances. The judge's dilemma is whether to punish the individual for the broader deterrent effect or to consider the individual circumstances that led to the crime. 
The trolley problem here echoes the words of 18th century jurist Sir William Blackstone. It is better that 10 guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer, which means it is better to be on the side of caution when convicting someone of a crime. To falsely convict and imprison someone is a terrible thing to do. In the medical field, the trolley problem's implications become starkly evident in the allocation of scarce resources such as during the COVID-19 pandemic when ventilators were in short supply. Physicians often had to make difficult decisions about which patients uh, would receive life-saving interventions. This brings to mind the Hippocratic Oath's principle of do no harm, which becomes complicated when it is impossible to not harm. The advent of autonomous vehicles has transported the trolley problem from philosophical texts into engineering labs. Programmers must embed moral decisions into algorithms. Should an autonomous car swerve to avoid a group of pedestrians if it means endangering the life of its passenger? Here the trolley problem transcends philosophical debate and demands practical application, reflecting the concerns of technology ethicist Shannon Valor, who said, Technology is driving the future, but who is steering? In my perspective, the trolley problem stands without a definitive resolution. This philosophical conundrum isn't crafted for solution, but rather to stir contemplation and foster intellectual dialogue, recognizing the complexities of morality and our own constraints as moral beings. It is obvious that most people would pull the lever, but why? That is the question. What goes on inside our head that urges us to think that sacrificing a person is better for the common good? Why don't we just stay passive? And would we really act so in a real scenario? How would we feel after doing that? These are hard questions that require hard thinking. I'm not sure if the discourse surrounding the trolley problem is about finding answers, but more about understanding the importance of the reasoning behind those choices. When we reason, we become more conscious about our decisions. Not every viewpoint on the trolley problem is equally defensible. We must admit that some resolutions are more justifiable than others, and through reasoning and debate, wins closer to them. I believe that a flawless answer to the trolley problem or a universal agreement on the optimum solution is unattainable. What we can, and indeed should strive for, is to apply philosophical thought and scientific inquiry to perpetuate this discussion. The trolley problem doesn't need to be solved. It should be considered and revisited in our dialogues periodically. Morality is at the core of our social fabric and it is constantly haunted, especially nowadays where wars are breaking out like it's the most normal thing. Our morality is haunted by religion. It is haunted by ideology. It is haunted by nationalism. It is haunted by dogmatism. My whole life I have been trying to see clearly through all this noise and come up with moral solutions to problems that I have to face. And it hasn't been easy. It will never be. But at least I'm trying. Uh-oh, Nicholas. This train is going to crash into these five people. Should we move the train to go this way or should we let it go that way? Which way should the train go? <laughs> <laughs>